It's been a pretty solid day, uh, and I'm sorry, but there's just one last solid bit to go before we get to the questions. Um, but just before I do that, I wanted to uh, uh, just follow on from uh, Ryan's talk with uh, a quick plug for a, a public debate that took place in Australia between Peter Singer and the Archbishop of, of Sydney, um, Anthony Fisher. Some of you may have seen that debate. Uh, it's, it's superb. It's properly done in the sense that there was equal time, proper back and forth, uh, good quality questions and so on. And fascinatingly, during that, if you have a chance to look at it, you'll, you'll see Peter Singer completely discounting any problems in the jurisdictions in which euthanasia or assisted suicide has occurred, which is quite remarkable. But um, a quick plug for MercatorNet. Some of you will be familiar with MercatorNet. Uh, MercatorNet actually uh, has a link to that and, a, and a, a short story that goes with it. If you don't know about MercatorNet, you should just uh, find out from Bob. Okay. I'm going to uh, uh, briefly cover some of the key issues that uh, occur within the context of reproductive technology uh, before zeroing in a little bit on surrogacy. But before I do that, I just, uh, as a point of focus, want to remind us of the reality for women and couples who are childless, that this can be an extremely painful and an extremely deep felt need. And I think it's worth keeping that at least somewhere within the picture. Because if we're, if we're going to argue against some practices, it's very helpful if we can argue for some realistic means of either alternative, whether it be adoption or whatever, or other means of assisting and caring for people who do have that kind of struggle, which can be enormously painful for them. Now, it's a very strange juxtaposition, those two words, because surrogacy is really very old and reproductive technology is very new. Uh, the two have converged in a particular way in recent history. Um, but let's just reflect briefly on surrogacy uh, historically. There's one notable example that most of you will, of course, know about, and that's the story of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, and the offspring Isaac and Ishmael, Jew and Arab. It's an interesting story. It's not perhaps what you'd call a typical surrogacy case, because it's questionable whether um, Ishmael was actually handed over um, and ultimately was cared for by Hagar. So it's not quite like surrogacy, but it's enough like surrogacy for us to reflect on it. Um, and it's interesting that if we think about that particular example, I think we could probably agree that it may not have turned out all that well either at the time or subsequently if we look historically at what that has meant uh, about uh, Jewish and Arab relationships. So that's just an interesting flashback to an older form of surrogacy. Now that form of surrogacy was what's called traditional surrogacy or partial surrogacy in the sense that Hagar actually was both gestational mother and genetic mother of Ishmael, but Abraham was genetic father. Okay, so in that traditional form of surrogacy, uh, which could be done today as well, either by direct uh, relationship between a man and a surrogate or with artificial insemination, that's partial surrogacy. What reproductive technology has brought is something utterly new. As soon as the first research occurred in which human life was created outside of the human body, a whole new paradigm was set in motion. Embryos as vulnerable, vulnerable as they are, became a whole lot more vulnerable. And a whole lot of possibilities appeared on the horizon that were never there before. The story of reproductive technology is one that's particularly interesting in the light of uh, things like slippery slopes or mission creep. Because when reproductive technology first came along, it was ostensibly for that very purpose I mentioned at the start, which is providing for the couple who cannot have a child. Desperate to have a child, here's an option. That's what it was orig originally set up for. But as we have seen with a lot of these issues, there is a mission creep. And there are a lot of practices within reproductive technology which are now, uh, some of them becoming a bit more mainstay and others still a bit fringe, uh, 
uh, and others still, which are somewhat futuristic, but there's enough there to suspect that as time rolls by, some of these more futuristic ones may actually come to some form of fruition. So there's a deep interconnectedness between these sorts of moral questions and all sorts of moral questions. And reproductive technology, which really is terribly new, uh, Louise Brown, the first IVF child, was born in 1978. It's very new. Um, that, that newness of uh, reproductive technology actually has some interesting philosophical roots in what might be called the control ideologies. And the control ideologies really had a bit of a heyday in the 20s and 30s. That was really the uh, birth of the population control movement, uh, some of the flowering, if you want to use that sort of terminology, of the eugenics movement, which started in the post-Darwinian late 1800s, the beginning of uh, certainly under Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, uh, the beginnings of birth control. So we have birth control, population control, eugenic control, and interestingly now, control at the end of life through uh, possibility of euthanasia and assisted suicide. So these sort of control ideologies have a, a different kind of uh, philosophical route to them. In that control, they are in contrast, at least when it comes to the bringing of children into the world, with the notion of a child as a gift. There's a different way of thinking about bringing to be. Bringing to be via a child as a gift, uh, an openness to other means which come through reproductive technology of control. So what I want to do just initially before talking about surrogacy is uh, uh, just run through briefly some of those things within reproductive technology which are uh, either current practices or leading edge practices or slightly futuristic ones. Because I think that gives us uh, pause for thought about where the whole reproductive technolo technology enterprise may be going, even though at the moment the majority of practices within reproductive technology are to do with traditional IVF, uh, a couple will come in and sperm and egg from that couple, from a married couple, uh, will be used in the, in, um, uh, for in vitro fertilisation, production of an embryo or many, and then implantation of one or more embryos in the body of the woman. So that's the traditional kind of thing, and most IVF will be of that nature, but there are all these other practices, and there are other consequences that flow from the practices. Nope. Is there a switch on the side I'm missing? There we go. Uh, let me just use this, uh, this quote from uh, a bioethicist called Joseph Fletcher, who was some, sometimes affectionately called old Joe Fletcher. And uh, this is how you turn an understanding on its head. He says, the real choice is between accidental or random reproduction and rationally willed or chosen reproduction. Laboratory reproduction is radically human compared to conception by ordinary heterosexual intercourse. It is willed, chosen, purposed and controlled and surely those are among the traits that distinguish human sapiens from others in the animal genus from the primates on down. That's how you turn something on its head. That's how the notion of gift and openness is turned into one of control and manipulation. So what he's basically saying is, it is far more radically human to have that degree of control than it is to openly accept what the genetic lottery uh, does or does not provide. It's worth being reminded all the time that there's a strong element of mystery to all of this. It doesn't really matter at one level how much science is able to reveal, at its core, this should still be a jaw-dropper. It should still be a jaw-dropper that that's the origin of each of us. It is quite remarkable, but you know, it just sort of becomes so familiar that we forget, and perhaps we forget the sense of mystery that goes with that moment of conception and how marvelous it really is. And it's in that sense of mystery that I think the notion of gift finds a place.
the acceptance of mystery has something in common with the notion of accepting a gift. So, what happens in reproductive technology? What are some of the practices which uh, create the most significant ethical challenges? Alternate familial relationships, my daddy's name is Donor. This was a t-shirt which some people thought was a good idea to send to donor kids. Um, there is actually an interesting movement underway at the moment amongst children born of donor sperm who were in that time period in which donor uh, donation was done anonymously. And so those are people who have, many of whom, not all, many of whom have been desperately trying to find out who their biological father is. And uh, there's, there's a fascinating story and lots of fascinating stories in that search, but it does tell you something quite profound that the knowledge of our origins is important to us. It's important to us, it's, it's important to know what the connectedness is, where we fit and where we might find meaning and a place. Um, now, having said that, uh, I was involved in some work back in South Australia before um, the end of last year on adoption. And adoption is one of those very convoluted, difficult stories uh, because of a lot of the history of adoption. And there were some, some terrible practices which happened, and I suspect it was probably the same here in the, in the, in the uh, uh, 50s, 60s and 70s where children were removed from young girls um, really I think without their consent a sort of a cultural practice and we now find a lot of grieving women who uh, struggle with that immensely so adoption is not some instant panacea that's an important part of the message but what adoption tells us is that it does matter what your origins are just as much as it matters within reproductive te technology we should have known we should have known when, when um, donor sperm and donor egg were being talked about that this was going to create problems. And a colleague I used to work with said he actually articulated that message at the time. In the 70s when the legislation in South Australia, my home state, was being worked through. He said that was, that was put out, that was made very clear that this would be a big problem area and no one would have a bar of it and so anonymous sperm donation happened. Um, and now of course the chickens are coming home to roost. Uh, and of course, the question does arise, what sort of donated gametes might you want? Now, I don't expect you to be able to read that. It's very terribly fine, fine print. But it's highlighting one particular issue. And it's actually not that tangentially connected to the control ideology that came through the eugenics movement, that there would be some way of having a control over human futures. There would be some sort of control about what sort of human being. And so we saw the rise of the sperm banks and egg banking, uh, and uh, the ability to select the donor you wanted, a donor of a particular sort, a donor that might have certain characteristics that you would like to see expressed in your offspring. So uh, this uh, uh, business of making a selection about characteristics, human characteristics, probably began there after the whole eugenics movement had died down with the ugliness of its result in in wartime years, that all died away, but there's a resurgence, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a newness in that eugenic kind of principle which uh, lives on. Uh, some other things which can happen, of course, with a donated egg, it's possible for people who are well and truly past their reproductive years to uh, give birth to a child, in this case, uh, at the age of 67. Uh, this is not so much the issue, issue it used to be. Uh, multiple uh, births in uh, Reptech were common. In the early days, it's a terrible shot, I'm sorry. Uh, anyone who loves The Simpsons will have a chuckle. Um, that's a good way to lose your train of thought. Now, uh, so, so in the early days of reproductive technology, when uh, IVF, traditional IVF was done, many embryos would have been created and because the success rates were not that high, a lot of embryos were implanted. So every so often, a lot of those embryos actually did implant in the uterine wall and became multiple pregnancies uh, with all the attendant risks. Now, as it stands now, reproductive technologies tended to refine those procedures so that the risk of multiples is not anywhere near as high, but by the same token, the incidence of twins and triplets is still significantly above the average, quite a bit 
sex selection. Uh, sex selection was carried out by a group called Sydney IBF in Australia for quite a period of time before they stopped doing that. Uh, it's one of the three issues, along with surrogacy, um, which is uh, a point of discussion when the Australian Reproductive Technology Guidelines put out by our National Health and Medical Research Council were up for discussion. It's one of those things, surrogacy, sex selection, and another thing I'll come to in a moment, are the three things up for discussion um, which uh, may uh, find some change in legislation. Keeping in, in keeping with the theme of what particular sort of child, it's quite possible within IVF programs at the moment uh, to carry out a procedure where the early stage embryo there on the far left uh, can have one cell removed and that can be genetically tested for a whole range of genes, typically single gene disorders, and then a judgment made about that particular embryo as to whether it has a disorder or, uh, or this is, can be done with the sex selection as well, whether it's a, a boy or a girl, and then either that embryo would be implanted or discarded. So in this particular example, the, t the green ones are obviously the good and the other ones are the undesired embryos, and so some embryos would be discarded. Now, whilst that particular practice at the moment is targeted towards single gene disorders and will be probably kept within the province of therapeutic goals, it's actually quite possible as genetics advances, as it's very rapidly doing so at the moment, uh, to the point where other genetic tests will be able to be conducted. Other genetic tests moving out of the realm of the therapeutic and into the realm of the trait and characteristic. So that's entirely possible. You can go online at the moment and buy a, uh, a kit from the US and have your own gene for fast or slow twitch muscle fibres uh, conducted and you'll determine whether you have more fast twitch than slow twitch and therefore are more likely to be a sprinter than if you had slow twitch over fast twitch and are more likely to be a long distance runner. If that test were applied to an embryo, if the parents really wanted to use that, and thought we're, an ath we're a, a sports mad family and we're into athletics, why shouldn't we actually choose an embryo which has much greater chance of being a sprinter? Because that's the family thing. I know that might sound far-fetched, but it, it's becoming more and more possible, certainly technologically, if not in a regulatory sense, for that to be done. Genetic testing well beyond the health paradigm. Um, there are a few key cases, uh, some will remember the story, a book by Jody Pucou, I probably said that wrong, it's French, uh, and was put into a film, my, si my Sister's Keeper. The idea here was that um, a couple with a very sick child would be able to have another child who not only did not have that illness, but was a tissue matched donor for the sick child, so that when the child selected through the procedure I described before, came to a certain age, that child would be able to be used for bone marrow transplants, stem cell transplants, or what other, whatever other form of treatment may be possible for the sick child. Again, there's a strong, on an individual basis here, when you've got a desperately sick child who, who might die without a bone marrow donor and you can't find one, that's what drove these cases. So you can see some of the difficulty in tension in this, I certainly don't think that should have happened, but I'm a, I can understand some of the feeling and the pressure that went into it, but I think it's a real tragedy that it did because it was the first clear example of a child brought in deliberately to serve the needs of another child. And in the way that story played out, the psychological impact on the saviour sibling was quite profound, pr profoundly negative. Um, Human genetic engineering, we're getting into the forefront and uh, sort of uh, not quite lunatic fringe, but the leading edge. Um, in 2010, the UK's uh, Human Embryology and, and Fertil Fertility Act, I think I got that correct, um, made permission for genetic engineering to be conducted on human embryos as long as they were not implanted in the body of a woman. So it opened up for the first time in a legislative context permission for scientists to conduct genetic modification experiments directly on human embryos. Again, in the first instance, that would be directed towards health issues, but it also it opens up the possibility of other sorts of um, 
characteristics as well and traits uh, being used. Uh, obviously, this is the interesting thing here is that this is corn, uh, and there's a lot of backlog of research in plant and animals to provide the technology necessary for it to be done in higher order animals like humans. Um, there have been a few of these key cases of IVF mix-ups where uh, a couple received the wrong embryo. Um, and then in this particular example, there was this tragic and sort of impossible set of circumstances created where a couple who were she was implanted with the wrong embryo, gave birth to a child, and then it, the, the error was discovered, and the genetic parents of the child said, that's our child. And uh, obviously, this couple were extremely distraught, and were placed in a situation where, whilst in law, she, as the birth mother, was the legal parent, they decided to hand the child back to the genetic couple. It just created a terrible situation. This, this sort of mix-up came to light, uh, and it comes to light most obviously, when a white couple give birth to a black child. But the white couple giving birth to a white child might not get picked up uh, until perhaps there's some suspicions a long way down the line that something doesn't seem right and genetic testing could be done. And so that, what I'm getting at is there could well be a few more mix-ups than, than we realise at this stage. It's hard to know, and we hope that's not the case, obviously. Um, back to the, to the UK, they've, they've gone one step further and permitted hybridisation with animals at the, um, uh, in a particular procedure which involves use of an animal egg and fusing with a human cell to create a hybrid, which is about 99% human, and uh, about 1.1% of the DNA is from the animal. But... That's a particularly genetic, genetically reductionist way of thinking about this question because it's basically saying that genes are only what really counts but all the, uh, the other machinery within the cell which belongs to the animal might be doing things about the expression of the human genes that we don't know. So you might ask, what's the, what's the point of doing an experiment like that? Part of it is, well, it's there to do. It's exciting to do on the part of some scientists. The other motivation is to see whether it's possible to create human embryonic stem cells, the cells, you may remember that debate, which has gone and faded away into the distance, the human stem cell debate. Um, but to create human stem cells, and when there's a paucity of human eggs available and lots of ethical problems with obtaining them, well, why not use animals? That's the way the argument goes. So uh, I think the only jurisdiction I'm aware of which has permitted this uh, procedure, and I could be wrong, a bit may have changed recently, um, is the UK. And of course human cloning, uh, that might seem far-fetched. Human embryos have been cloned, successfully developed to at least the five or seven cell stage, um, and uh, whether there are mavericks who've gone further that we don't know about, it's a mystery. Okay, let's, um, let's just zero in on surrogacy in particular, uh, as one of those practices which now marries with reproductive technology in a new way. And it creates uh, a, a set of possibilities which uh, are quite new. And just a little bit of, of uh, data from Australia. A very small number of children born of surrogacy in that's uh, 2011 within Australia, regulated surrogacy. We have a, a range of uh, legislation in the different states. Some of it varies significantly from, from other, but it's basically a regulated form of surrogacy. In my home state, that legislation basically permits uh, only married couples to undertake regulated surrogacy, uh, that contracts are not ultimately enforceable. Um, I think the, the state was terrified of the notion that a surrogate would want to hold on to a child uh, and change her mind, uh, that that might become a scenario for which a child could be removed from a surrogate against her wishes, which is a thought the state did not want to countenance, that that would be a forcible removal from a ch of a child from his or her mother. Um, so contracts are unenforceable, uh, but they are nevertheless written up as an intent uh, there are variations in who can be the surrogate. 
and that varies from legislature to legislature. Uh, there are criminal offences in some and not in others, but there's lack of coherence across the country. Uh, prior to the change in legislation in South Australia, there was basically a stand back approach and if people wanted to undertake surrogacy, well that was their business and they would live with all of the difficult consequences of that. The law would not deliberately set up a statute in which it could be regulated. That was prior to the legislation and now we have a particular piece of legislation which regulates it. But the fascinating thing, and this has given rise to some particular cases um, in Australia recently, I don't know whether it's really reached here, the story of Baby Gammy. Um, Baby Gammy is a Downs child who was a twin. Uh, a couple from Perth went to Thailand to uh, undertake surrogacy and in the process these two children were born, a little boy and a little girl, and little boy had Downs. The couple took the little girl and fled the country, went back to Australia without little baby Gammy, and it became a, a story of national interest about well, what's actually happening overseas with Australians going and uh, obtaining surrogacy in places like India and Thailand and elsewhere. A little uh, addendum to that story, which emerged somewhat sometime afterwards, was that the, the father, the Perth, the Australian father, was um, someone who had past convictions for child abuse. So it raised all sorts of concerns that uh, people were actually accessing children overseas uh, and there may be an element within that which was for all the wrong reasons. Um, but look, we don't know, that's the problem. There's so much about surrogacy practice which is not known in an unregulated environment in other countries. But 300 children born by surrogates, this is, this is a piece of research which uh, appeared in Australia recently. Half of the commissioning parents, that's the term usually used for the arranged parents, the commissioning parents, half of them had incomes over 150,000, so uh, that's, there's usually significant cost involved and only some can afford it. And approximately half were gay male uh, gay males, and there's an uncertainty about the proportion there of singles or couples. So, as I think came up in a couple of the other talks, the, um, the rise of the gay rights movement and its intent to provide circumstances equivalent to other relationships means that children become part of that desire. Now, for a gay males, there's no other way than by adoption or by surrogacy to obtain a child. And with the desire for a genetic link, and this is a fascinating one, the desire for a genetic link is a strong one and we can understand that. But that desire for a genetic link with a gay couple can of course only be with one in that couple. Uh, and in fact, whether the couple's gay or not, it's quite likely that it's, it's certainly possible that there may not be a genetic link there as well. And certainly with donor sperm and egg, there will not be a genetic link with both in the couple. I know, I, I realise this gets complicated and messy. You have to sort of do some strange juxtapositions in your mind. And, and we, we do have a, uh, a pretty clear understanding of what we understand familial relationships to be, but they can become something quite other in this territory. And I'll come to one in a moment. But uh, just to finish this uh, bit of data off, um, I shouldn't have made that thing so dark, it's hard to read. There was a, uh, one of the findings of the study was a preparedness to undertake surrogacy even though it was illegal to do so in your home state. So a couple in a state, Queensland's one example, where it is illegal to go overseas and undertake surrogacy, were nevertheless prepared to do that. Uh, and that points to the difficulty that there's no one policing and no one wishing to carry through on what the law actually requires. And people became aware of that and so they're prepared to do that even in the face of that illegality. Um, the only other thing that's unknown within this 
space is how many surrogacy arrangements are occurring outside of the regulated environment and not overseas. In other words, simple um, understandings between individuals within Australia doing their own sort of surrogacy arrangements, not accessing Australian law because it's a complicated process, not going overseas because it's expensive, but just having a child and handing the child back to another couple. We don't know the extent of that. Uh, there's some anecdotal evidence that it's significant, uh, but we just don't know it. Uh, but what it, what it does mean is that uh, um, there could well be a whole range of practices there and that when we think about the best in interest of the child, are actually potentially, along with all the other surrogacy, an expansion of that problem that the child's interests are not gaining weight or given credit in this whole equation. It, it's interesting, you, you probably picked up from all that I've said so far, and I hope you have, that the child tends not to get a mention up front. Uh, the child is actually part of the arrangement, uh, part of the deal, part of the um, part of the, of the intent and product. I use those words, you know, and some people will use the word commodity. Uh, it's very strong, but when we get to commercial surrogacy, as happens overseas, then you can understand that thinking. So what are the key drivers? Key drivers are increasingly delayed childbearing, leading to age-based infertility, not just a problem for surrogacy, but for access to IVF. Um, as people leave their uh, child rearing to later and later. Uh, there are a lot of women, for example, who don't realise that past the age of 32, um, their fertility is declining at a rather rapid rate. Dramatic decline in adoption, that's a whole other story in its own right. Um, Inter-country adoption programs are now tightening up their eligibility criteria. India has just made it not possible for surrogacy to occur except for stable married couples. Uh, the rise of reproductive technology and what it's got to offer, obviously. Uh, changing social mores, an increasing number of single and partnered gay men wanting children, as I've already mentioned. That's a strong driver. And here's one example, and I think this is probably uh, a particular sort of example to explore for a moment some of the comp complexities in, in relational connections that can arise. In this particular case, uh, and let me say up front, that with smiling happy people and a beautiful baby, it's a really difficult thing to criticise, but Kyle, a single gay man, his mother, Anne-Marie, and baby Miles. Baby Miles was conceived using Kyle's sperm and a donor's egg, so there's another square off to the side here with a, a face that we don't know what's in it. So a donated egg, his sperm, baby Miles, gestated in his mother. Okay, so once the embryo was produced, implanted in Anne-Marie, gave birth, handed back to Kyle as the uh, single parent of this child. So, what's the relationship between Miles, baby Miles, and Anne-Marie. Uh, she's the gestational mother, so she's mother in that sense. She's not the biological mother. She's somehow connected in a new way, not just as a mother to Kyle, but also as a partner of sorts to Kyle. She is both mother and grandmother to baby Miles. And uh, there's somewhere off the side will be the donor mother we know nothing about who uh, Miles may never know or may, we just don't know. Um, what's the relationship? I won't go any further. It gets really messy. But <laughs> the relationship between Kyle and Miles is a really interesting one because they're both born of the same woman. Okay, so it's, it's that kind of new set of familial relationships become terribly confusing and about which we know some, but not everything, about the impact on the child. Now, I want to just very briefly go through some of the big questions, because I'm going to run out of time, uh, and then talk very quickly about the welfare of the child. Some of the big questions are this main overarching one about, arching one about the, the commodification of reproduction. Uh, the, the notion that we're actually moving into territory where children are away from gifts 
and are now products. Uh, this is really acute when commercial interests become involved. Uh, in India and Thailand, and I believe it's much the same in America, commercial transactions are permitted. So um, generally poor women in India and uh, Thailand have been the ones who have provided their bodies for surrogacy for a fee which for them is a lot of money but for those overseas is not that much to part with. And typically, uh, and we can see a thematic connection here with, with euthanasia, I think it's the poor and disadvantaged who will be the ones who are, who are prepared to uh, provide their bodies for this service. And so it's a service and it's a handing over of a child and money changes hands. It's not terribly much different than trafficking. It's just, it, it's child trafficking uh, set up in a, a, a quasi-legitimate uh, uh, legitimate way. And this is the only context, surrogacy, when, where you, wherein you can have the complete fracturing of motherhood, um, where uh, typically motherhood means um, biological mother, genetic, gestational mother carrying the child, and social. We know that there are contexts in which, um, through disadvantage or damage or harm, there will be mothers who are biological mothers but not able to be social mothers and in adoption. This, and adoption's uh, within the context of a, a rescue, a sense of rescue. This is in the context of deliberate and intentional fracturing of motherhood into those three elements. So here we have an example, I think in the one just before, depending on what Anne-Marie, the mother, is going to do. And we've got a biological mother off to the side, uh, an absence of a social mother at all, because Carl is going to raise Miles by himself, and Anne-Marie, the gestational mother, we have no idea what her involvement, if any, will be in the raising of Miles. So Miles has come into the world with an intentional fracturing of motherhood behind him. Uh, fam family secrecy, there's good evidence to show that uh, uh, as, as high as 50% of families um, undertaking uh, donor sperm, donor egg, or surrogacy itself, which will involve that, um, have no intention to tell the child. Okay, it's a very high figure, 50%. Believe that family secrecy is the best thing. What that might mean for a child, again, we should have learnt from adoption, we know well from adoption, that when children discover down the line something that was so fundamental to their being, but they were not told that they had a mother somewhere else, and they had brothers and sisters and other sets of relationships, and they were not told that they have, that has a significantly detrimental impact. We knew that from adoption. You think we would have learned. Um, the New South Wales Reform Commission did a, an under, a study of surrogacy and uh, made this fascinating statement. It's back in 88, and it's fascinating how things have changed since, but they made this astute statement that there seems to be a slippage in the argument from desire for a child, to need for a child, to moral right to have a child, to a legal right to have a child, to a legal right to be provided with a child by whatever means are necessary. That kind of slippage, that kind of shift in our understanding not only of human rights, but individual freedoms, has brought us to the point we now find ourselves in. Just quickly, I don't have much time left, the welfare of the child. Declaration on the rights of the child makes it very clear. A child of tender years shall not, save in exceptional circumstances, be separated from his mother. Every form of surrogacy will involve the intentional removal of the child from his her, or her mother, of course with the caveat that this is fractured motherhood. Now, I'm not obviously a woman who's had a child, but women who have had children tell me that pregnancy is unique and special and a, 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 a time of extremely close bonding between mother and child. And there's plenty of developmental work to show that the early days of post-birth, of uh, bonding and attachment to the mother are critical. Now, if that bonding and attachment is intentionally broken at a period of time anywhere from up to six months after birth, we really don't know what that means for the, for the welfare of the child. So in one sense, this is, and the whole reproductive technology enterprise, at least in this area, is a huge experiment with the lives of human beings. A huge experiment. 
so that's uh, gestation tied intimately to the life of the mother and child. Uh, Neonative cognitive attachments, intersubjective interactions between the gestational mother and, the, and breastfeeding. And I've mentioned about genealogical, genealogical bewilderment is the term sometimes used about relationships that are confusing. Within the context of RepTech itself, there are health issues and they are emerging uh, as, time, as more and more research is being done. But what's interesting here, particularly, is that I found hardly any research on uh, surrogate, uh, children born by surrogacy. Now, just in purely biological terms, the idea of taking an embryo that is genetically unrelated to a woman and putting that embryo within that woman's body, that may well have some sort of health parameter or issue that is additional to any of the others that we know about already in reproductive technology. We know there are plenty emerging at the moment. Um, you know, obviously, we would wish that there were none because there are over, I don't know, what is it, two and a half million children born of IVF and no one would wish there to be any health issues at all. But if the reality is that there are, then it means we need to have pause for reflection about what we're doing. And in the particular context of surrogacy, uh, that's largely unknown. I've mentioned uh, contract enforceability, what happens if a surrogate either wants to keep the child or if a surrogate has a disabled child, is that written into the contract, as in the baby gammy case? Do the commissioning parents have the right to demand an abortion? Um, because it's, it's their genetic child and the surrogate must do what she's told. But if she doesn't want to, what happens? Uh, what will that mean for the child to understand their, uh, the way that they were thought about? Uh, there's some data to show that there are higher level adjustment problems amongst surrogacy children at age seven. You see, we only know some of this research to age 10 now, I think it is. It's very new. Um, but one thing we do know from some work done by Gollenbach is that it's more difficult, or it seems to be more difficult for youngsters to deal with the idea that they grew in an unrelated woman's womb than with the concept that they are not biologically related to one parent or the other. So it's one step beyond in potential impact on the child than donor sperm or egg. Um, I don't have time to do this, I've actually run out of time, uh, but I think that there's a whole uh, another story here for the welfare of the surrogate, and I'm sorry to have left it at that point because I think that that's an equally important part of the equation, particularly when the argument being used, at least in Australia at the moment, for unregulated surrogacy overseas is to bring it back, make it regulated, and introduce commerce. Okay? So what has been in Australia, the legislation that currently exists does not allow any valuable consideration, any changing hands of money, but the argument now is the only way you're going to stop the overseas one is to allow that to happen within Australia and at least we'll regulate it. We'll regulate how much money can change hands. It doesn't do much for all of those big questions about commodification or the, the fact that surrogates will also come from poor students or other sources who are at the bottom of the tree. Um, so let me just finish with a quote, if I could. This is a, uh, a statement put to a um, legislature in the US where surrogacy was being considered. And this person wrote, and this, is, this comes up in First Things, the journal First Things. In reading the bill, I was struck that nothing was said about the child to be born of the surrogate arranged agreement much about the rights and responsibilities of the gestational mother, a very strange expression, and the intended parent, but nothing is said about the child. The child is treated as a thing to be used as the gestational carrier and intended parents wish. This is the most troubling feature of the proposed law. It gives no indication that one is dealing here with, human, with a human person who will have feelings, thoughts and memories. These are all swept aside as though the child to be born will have no interest in how he or she came into the world, who, has, or who his or her parents are, and all the other things that are so fundamental to our identity as human beings. Thank you. <laughs>